Data leakage. Conventional embedding algorithms, such as the TSNE, are designed for single-site computation and require data centralization. Privacy leakage may H. Up and in three stages in the visualization pipeline. What do you believe is the correlation between labor union participation and corporate profits of different companies? How would you update your belief after seeing this scatter plot? In this study, we use a new elicitation technique to understand how people update their beliefs about correlations after seeing different visualizations with and without uncertainty depictions. Many techniques can be used to render and visually explore large 3D line sets with transparency. However, all these techniques differ in several aspects such as runtime performance, memory consumption, and image quality. In this work, we provide an extensive comparison study to discuss the advantages and drawbacks of transparency rendering techniques for large line datasets. We present a framework for the visual exploration of spine simulation data. We show the force distribution on spinal discs, enable assessments of imbalances, and reveal impact vectors that were not accessible before. This is a novel direction in medical visualization, and we hope that it might bridge the gap between biomechanical research and clinical application. This has been successfully helping not only experts, but also people who want to learn about AI. At VAST 2018, we presented GANLAB, an interactive tool for learning about a deep learning model called GAN. But how does this help these learners? We conducted two evaluation studies, including log analysis of our demo used by over 100,000 people. We will be sharing our findings with you. We present AgentViz, an application for the visual analysis of core center agent behavior using hierarchical glyphs. Our application relies on a data-driven scatterplot layout with each glyph representing an individual core center agent. We demonstrate the application with nearly 5 million cores who interact with over 6,500 core center agents. To reduce clutter, we present a dynamic aggregating glyph clustering technique that varies with zoom level, maximizing the screen space. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Viz short paper session on theory, cognition, and sense making. My name is Cindy Xiong, and I will be chairing this session today. We have nine great talks, and I encourage you to take advantage of the Discord and YouTube platforms to ask questions and interact with the presenters. We're going to start with a presentation from Terence Lau from Georgia Tech, who will share with us a systematic review of 20 automated insight tools from data analytics. I'm Terence Law, and I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech. For this talk, I'll be presenting some of our exciting findings from a review of systems that automatically communicate data insights to users. I want to start my talk with this mind-blowing quote. The purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. Because providing insight is such an important goal of visual data analysis, Visualization researchers have developed systems that automatically extract and communicate data insights to blow users' mind. So um, this is quick insights in Power BI. When you load your data into the tool, it automatically generates a page of statistical facts about your data set. And there are many systems that have a very similar nature. All these systems aim to automatically communicate data insights by recommending potentially interesting visualizations or by generating textual descriptions of statistical facts in a, in a data set. This fascinating space of tools raises many interesting questions. For example, quite a number of them use the term insights to describe what they do but we all know that insight is an overloaded term, and so it is not clear what they mean by insight. We also observed that uh, these tools are designed for many different purposes. Many of them are designed for data exploration, but more recent tools aim to facilitate communication and some other purposes. So we were interested in learning more about the types of insights these tools provide and the purposes of providing these insights. And um, so we've conducted a systematic literature review to create a framework of types and purposes. Um, so here's some nomenclature before I dive into the paper collection process and our findings. In our paper, we define automatically generated insights uh, or auto insights as data observations created by uh, automation that are presented as charts or textual descriptions. It is a reasonable definition because this definition captures what the developers of these systems mean when they use the term insight. And we call um, these systems that automatically extract and communicate auto insights as auto insight tools. With these definitions in mind, we collected 12 papers as the seed papers. 10 seed papers come from a um, recent blog post about visualization recommendation systems written by Lee. The other two seed papers um, are two recent publications at this about systems that automatically generate textual descriptions of statistical facts. With the 12 seed papers, we iteratively collected papers cited by the seed papers and the papers citing the seed papers. In the end, we collected 20 papers that describe some auto insight tools. Uh, and with these 20 auto insight tools, we coded the types of auto insights they provide and the purposes of providing auto insights. And um, so here are our findings. From the set of papers we reviewed, we identified 12 types of auto insights and four purposes of providing these insights. So this bar chart shows the frequency of occurrence for each type of auto insights. The most common type of auto insights is outliers. 
Uh, it can be outliers in a numerical variable, in two numerical variables, or in a time series. Uh, the View Space Explorer is an example. It recommends outliers in two numerical variables. And um, what it does is it enables users to rank the scatter plots based on whether there are some outlying points in the scatter plots. Uh, for the sake of time, I wouldn't go over the other types, and I encourage you to read the paper for the details. And so here is uh, another bar chart for the purposes of providing auto insights. We can see that the most commonly cited purpose is exploratory analysis. The developers of many of these auto insight tools claim that during data exploration, there are many charts users need to explore. And by enumerating the charts, assigning a score to the charts and ranking them, users can review fewer charts. The View Space Explorer is again a good example. If you have n attributes, uh, there are n times n minus 1 divided by two scatter plots you can explore during exploratory analysis. But if I rank the scatter plots based on a metric like correlation, you can immediately see the ones that are highly correlated. And this reduces the number of scatter plots you need to look at to find the highly correlated ones. Besides data exploration, some of the goals have emerged more recently, like uh, supporting communication. Um, so users may not know how to interpret a visualization. Some of these tools provide textual descriptions to facilitate visualization interpretation. And another purpose is focused analysis. These tools allow users to specify a high-level question like, uh, what is the difference between US and European cities, and get suggestions. And the final purpose is to support data wrangling, which appears uh, in only one tool. The profiler tool automatically mines data quality issues and recommends charts to visualize the issues. So, what are the design opportunities? If we look at uh, these types of auto insights again, we can see that not many tools support compound facts, or in other words, uh, facts that contain multiple facts. So, future auto insight tools could provide more nuanced auto insights by merging different pieces of information and using more sophisticated generation logics. Another observation is um, the emerging use of these systems beyond exploratory analysis. There are tools that are used in communication and focused analysis, and it would be interesting to know how these auto insight tools can be applied for other use cases. In a paper, we have a more in-depth discussion of the design opportunities emerged from our literature review. So take a look at the paper. So we, we feel that um, automated insights are an exciting and growing research area. It would be really, really awesome to see more novel techniques to generate data insights and studies of these techniques. Uh, with that, thank you for watching this talk. Thank you, Terence, for the presentation. We have some really great questions in the Discord channel. Um, to start off, people have been discussing uh, the loaded term of insight in your paper and presentation. So what is an insight to you? Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's a very complicated um, you know, question. Uh, and, and I really think that you should uh, look at my second talk that is um, coming soon in maybe 10 to 20 minutes. Um, that paper we talk about um, our interview study with some visualization practitioners and how they think um, about this term insight. Um, and to me, I, I think um, th th there's a, uh, actually lots of different aspects uh, when people talk about this idea of insights, right? So one aspect is um, definitely uh, the, the statistical information that you're able to get uh, out of um, the visualization. And I think um, 
th there can also be some other aspects like uh, whether you're able to trust that information that you get out of a visualization um, and uh, whether that piece of information is relevant to you or not. So uh, I, to me, to us, I, I think using this term of auto insights actually, um, you know, open up this space of um, very exciting research about like uh, when, when we generate these statistical facts, um, are we able to, you know, how, how do we uh, help people to trust that information? And, you know, when we um, try to generate these um, statistical facts or, you know, auto insights, uh, is it possible to make those uh, pieces of information more relevant to the context of our data analysis? So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and I, I think those are really, really great questions. Uh, yeah, that, that's our response. I see. And really quickly, could you comment on the potential distinction between findings and observations as well as auto insights and human insights? I, um, so I, um, I think the second question is a little easy as it, to us, uh, auto insights is more about uh, the, the statistical facts uh, generated by an automation. And um, in, in order to really try to provide insights to users, you, you need to think about a lot of different aspects like trust, like um, some of the things uh, that I've just mentioned, like whether those information is relevant to users or not. And uh, for human insights, it's more like, um, you know, you're able to internalize that information that you're able to obtain from maybe a visualization. And uh, through that interpretation, something that ha something is going to happen in your mind and stuff like that. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I forgot the, uh, the, the, the first question, but um, I, I, I think you really should look at the second talk as well, because that talk is going to provide a more comprehensive picture of um, what we mean by auto insights and what we mean by human insights. And I definitely would say that they are something different. Awesome, thank you, Terence. Uh, and we'll see a talk from Terence again uh, later on in the session today. And next we have Paul Parsons from Purdue University to talk to us about how visualization practitioners make design judgments. Let's welcome Paul. Data visualization as a profession is rapidly growing in popularity. As researchers, if we wish to influence the practice of visualization design, it is necessary to understand the ways in which practitioners structure their work in relation to the complexity they face in real world settings. InfoViz researchers have proposed various models of the design process and decisions that designers make. While these models have been influential in the research community, it is unclear how well they characterize and support design practice, especially in non-research settings where practitioners may ground their work and process in less theoretical and more pragmatic ways. Rational decision-making is often viewed as the standard for dealing with complex situations. This view leads to the development of formal models that purportedly capture key aspects of decision-making. However, empirical investigations into how people make decisions in complex settings involving uncertainty suggest that people rarely use rational decision-making strategies, instead relying on their previous patterns of experience to make judgments. These judgments tend to look much more like intuition than rational choices. In this work, we use the concept of design judgment to investigate how designers engage in decision-making in the complexity of real world practice. As part of a broader effort to understand DataViz design practice, we conducted semi structured interviews with 10 DataViz practitioners. We selected one portion of the interview to analyze, accounting for roughly 15 of the total 60 minutes. Recruiting was done via social media, the Data Visualization Society Slack workspace the InfoViz email list, and also directly contacting more than 200 individual practitioners and more than 30 visualization design agencies. Interviews were conducted remotely via video conferencing and were recorded and transcribed. The section of our interviews that we focused on asked participants about their typical design process at a high level and how they assessed their progress, including determining if they were on the right track and making decisions about what to do next in their process. Depending on the answers given, 
We asked a number of follow-up questions about their process and decision-making. The transcripts were deductively coded using Nelson and Stolterman's framework on design judgment. We operationalized the judgment types based on prior work done by one of the authors in another design context and use these types as a priori codes in our top-down thematic analysis. The table here lists the types used and their definitions. All judgment types were coded non-exclusively by two or more of the researchers on the team with the goal of reaching consensus and full agreement. We present our findings from two perspectives. First, we present how judgments emerged in the conversations with our participants specifically highlighting instances where one type of judgment was foregrounded and others had influence in the background. Second, we describe how these judgment types are complex and layered with multiple judgment types emerging together. It's worth noting that although, although there are eight judgment types, I present only three of them here for the sake of time. The first judgment type is a framing judgment, where designers identify salient elements, often through the introduction of explicit or decisive constraints. For P7, a framing judgment helped them focus on the client goal and the desired outcome. And they say, so the first thing that I need to have clear once I know that I want to accept the project is what is the goal for the client? So what is the main thing that the visualization should do? be able to kind of say that in one or two sentences. What should the people learn? And then having a feeling of the data, what variables are in there? The second judgment type is an appreciative judgment, where designers assign importance to some things and not to others without relying on an explicit hierarchy. Here's an example from P1 where they assign importance to what about the data they want to communicate saying there's obviously some seasonal variation the way it's portrayed now you can't tell what the seasonal variation is so i was thinking okay do we want to communicate seasonal variation and if so let me think about breaking it out this way do we want to communicate an overall decline and if so let me break it out this way instead the third judgment type is an instrumental judgment where designers select or reflect on the influence of tools in their process while there were a substantial number of examples of specific tools that are commonly used in data viz work, some of the more nuanced examples pointed out the limitations and strengths of various tools and how they might relate to one another. For example, P8 assessed the visual versus more data-focused elements of different tools, saying, in Illustrator, it's all about how does this look. If I'm an Illustrator, I'm not going to worry about getting everything data accurate. But if it's a complex visualization or it would just be too hard to execute in Illustrator and I go to code first, I literally might write the code to generate the visualization in D3. And in D3, I can export an SVG file, bring that back into Illustrator to then design it up. Our second finding is that judgments don't happen as individual discrete acts. They typically occur in complex layered ways where one judgment is foregrounded and others still have influence in the background. Our thematic analysis regularly resulted in multiple codes being applied to statements in an overlapping manner. Here's an example where we see P9 engaging in multiple overlapping judgments as a means of confronting the complexity of the design situation. There are framing and appreciative judgments to set the initial design space and potential outputs, connective and instrumental judgments about the tools being used and the ways in which they are connected while moving towards an outcome, navigational judgments that help deal with the complexity of the data in context, and quality and appearance judgments relating to the creativity and craft of making a point and creating something unique. This complex layering demonstrates how situated personal judgments are a means of moving through complexity towards a design outcome. Takeaways of this work include knowing that practitioners continuously rely on situated judgments in a layered and complex fashion. This is true across all aspects of their process. Practitioners did not describe their decision making in a rational way that aligns well with extant decision making models. And we suggest that the viz literature needs to expand to include more knowledge types beyond just abstract models. 
ones that are better able to characterize the situated and personal nature of design practice, especially if we're to adequately understand and influence design practice. Our work contributes a new conceptual language and theoretical framing for studying visualization design, particularly in terms of design practice and the ways in which designers face complexity and move through their design process. This contribution can also be valuable for practitioners as surfacing this way of knowing can help them become aware of their own judgment making and identify means to improve it. Our work has implications for data viz pedagogy as an appreciation of the personal and situation, situated nature of design is critical for preparing designers to face the complexities of real world practice. Future scholarship on data viz pedagogy and practice would benefit from focusing attention beyond formal objective knowledge and logical processes of decision making, allowing access to the rich nature of design expertise and the ways in which this expertise is developed over time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Paul, for the presentation. We have a question from Enrico Bertini. He asked, can the list of judgments be used to create better tools or ideas to support designers? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'm a bit skeptical about how directly it will influence uh, tool creation, uh, although I'm sure there are some indirect um, uh, Things that we can learn from from our from our participants in terms of what what they prefer to do with tools, I think um, it can definitely influence how designers are trained and how they think that they should be designing, um, especially in relation to expectations about how rational or uh, logical their process should be. Uh, and so that's not directly a, as a result of using the tool, but I think that's a sort of self-reflective um, aspect of, of the design process. Awesome, thank you, Paul. We'll get to hear more from Paul later this session. There's a couple of questions lingering in Discord and um, Paul, I encourage you to interact with everyone on the channel as well. Um, so next we have Terence Lau with us once again to talk to us about how some of his interviews with practitioners investigating what data insights are to professional visualization users. Welcome Terence. I'm Terence Lau and I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech. Today I'll be telling you something about data insights, in particular how do visualization practitioners perceive them? I believe all of you here would agree with me that insight is important in data visualization because the purpose of this is to provide insight. We want to know how to design better this to serve this purpose. In order to design visualization tools that can better provide insight, we need to know what insight is. Many visualization researchers have tried to do so, and there is a vibrant discussion of what insight is in the research community, but there is a missing perspective. We just don't know a lot about our users, the visualization practitioners, how they think about insight, um, but why is learning from practitioners important? It's because users are king. We create visualizations for some group of users. We cannot develop visualization systems for users based only on the speculation in the research community about what users think insight is. Another reason for our learning from practitioners is that we've seen many systems that aim to automatically communicate data insights to users. So um, this is a functionality called Quick Insights in Power BI. When you load your data set, it automatically generates some facts about your data set. For a car data set, it may say something like horsepower and weight are correlated. But we kept wondering whether these are insights to visualization practitioners. And if not, how do we improve these systems? 
To understand what data insights are to visualization practitioners, we interviewed practitioners who used visualization platforms like Tableau and Power BI as part of their jobs. We interviewed 23 practitioners in the US. They worked in 12 job sectors like consulting, retail, research, and education. They had between 2 to 20 years of experience with visualization platforms. So we talked about all sorts of different topics during the interviews. But for the scope of this paper, we focus only on these practitioners' experiences with data insights. During the interviews, we asked them to describe a finding from their data they considered to be insightful and the characteristics of the finding that made it insightful. So, what are data insights to these users? We identified seven characteristics from the data insights they described. The majority said that data insights had to be in, uh, actionable. These insights should help understand what actions to take in their organizations. That makes sense because for most of the time, we do data analysis not for curiosity, not as a hobby. We do it usually because we want to make some decisions and need data to inform the decisions. Some participants also talk about the collaborative aspects of data insights. When participants found something interesting from data, they may need to confirm the findings with the subject matter experts to understand if the insights were relevant. And many of them also described scenarios where they had an expectation about what they would see from the data, but they saw something that deviated from the expectation. So many of them felt that data insights can be unexpected at times. And in contrast, some participants said that insights were findings that were consistent with some existing beliefs. Or in other words, data insights can be confirmatory. There are some other characteristics that um, I will not go into detail for the sake of time. Participants also felt that data insights were trustworthy. Um, they want to be able to trust an observation from data. They felt that insights occur spontaneously when they were able to see data in ways they weren't previously able to. And finally, data insights were interconnecting. They happened when data observations were paired with domain knowledge or other contextual information. So what do all these characteristics tell us? They tell us something about these tools that aim to automatically provide data insights to users. During a visualization, along with a description like, there's a correlation between horsepower and weight, just doesn't do a good enough job in providing insight. To practitioners, to these visualization practitioners, data insights are way more complicated than that. So how do we redesign these systems? An idea is to acquire a user's mental model. Some characteristics of data insights, such as unexpected and confirmatory, were related to a user's mental model, like um, their expectations. If we can acquire people's mental model and recommend visualizations and textual descriptions accordingly, people may consider the visualizations and textual descriptions to be more insightful. So for example, Choi et al. proposed an idea called concept-driven analytics. Their idea is that users can articulate an expectation about the data like, I expect the US to have the highest GDP per capita in the world. And the system can show a visualization that confirms with or deviates from the expectation. And by confirming with or deviating from a user's mental model, hopefully the recommendations will be considered to be more insightful. And 
participants often commented that being able to trust a data insight is important. So another design idea is to ensure users are able to trust these recommendations. For example, validation mechanisms like hypothesis testing can be incorporated into these systems, these automated systems, to enable users to verify the recommendations. There are more design ideas to improve these automated systems in the paper, and we encourage you to take a look at it. With that, I would like to thank my advisors, Alex and John, and of course, I thank you for watching this talk. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We have some really great questions in the chat. Alex Kale asks, uh, what do you mean by actionable insights? Does an insight that encourages the stakeholders to do nothing count as actionable in this framework? And are designers comfortable finding and communicating this kind of insight particularly? Um, let, let me answer the first question. Um, I, I, I think if, uh, so after looking at the piece of information and you're able to draw uh, some conclusions that it's probably not worthwhile doing something. I, I think it's still an actionable insight because um, at, at least to me, not doing something is still an action. I'm not sure about how the people think about it, but I, I think it's actually an action. Um, and for the second question, can, can you repeat that again? Yeah, are, do you think designers would be comfortable finding and communicating insights that encourage people to do nothing? Uh, I, I'm actually not sure. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it depends on what you mean by uh, doing nothing, right? I, so if in a presentation I'm able to show you some evidence that uh, doing nothing is actually something good to do, then I don't see how it is different from when you're trying to present some findings that tell people to do something. So um, yeah, that, that's my response to that. Hopefully, I, I've answered your question. Yeah, there's a couple more questions from Tian Yi Li and Xiaoying Pu in the chat. Make sure to get to them if possible. Yeah, and sure. next, we have Mandy Keck from University of Technology in Dresden, Germany, to talk to us about how we can help students find or create the right visualization solutions. Let's welcome Mandy. Hello, I'm Mandy Keck from the University of Technology in Dresden and I want to talk today about our didactic methodology for crafting information visualizations. Our approach can assist students and anyone interested in crafting, ranking and improving novel visualization solutions. Our proposed didactic methodology consists of three main steps which follow divergent and convergent strategies. It starts with a morphological analysis step, then second a selection and fusion step, and at the end an improvement step. In the following I will describe these steps in detail. As input for our methodology we provide a data and task description and a construction kit for visual exploration interfaces. This construction kit was introduced in our previous work and provides a theoretical framework for deconstructing and also designing novel visualizations. I will use a recently published visualization technique called parallel hierarchies as an example to explain the structure of the construction kit. Parallel hierarchies are an interactive visualization solution for numerical aggregates over hierarchical categories and are shown in this picture. As you can see in the right column, parallel hierarchies can be described by the fusion of two visualization techniques, icicle plots and parallel sets. These two patterns on the right side define a construction plan that can be used to describe a visualization and also represent the highest level of the construction kit. A construction plan consists of patterns, here the icicle plot and parallel sets pattern, and different connectors that can be used to combine these patterns. These connectors are successive to show patterns successively, juxtaposed to show patterns next to each other, superimposed to show patterns combined in one view, 
and nested to show one pattern embedded in another one. This example uses the superimposed connector that merges two patterns in one view. Each of these patterns follow the what, why, how approach, which describes the underlying data structure and type. In this example, the patterns are suited for hierarchical and multidimensional data structures. Then second, the task to be solved with this pattern. In this example, both patterns are suited for analysis tasks. And last but not least, the visual representation and interaction techniques that describe how the interface is designed using a set of building blocks. The building blocks represent the smallest unit of the construction kit. The collection of building blocks are designed at a comparable abstraction level and together define a design space for a specific problem domain. Our design space includes different dimensions, visual elements, grid, layout structure and interaction to describe a visualization from different perspectives. As an example, I use the parallel set pattern. The visualization technique can be described by combining the building blocks flow as visual element, a rectangular grid building block, a parallel plot layout structure and the interaction building blocks highlight and inspect. After the description of the construction kit, I would now like to explain the single steps of our methodology. The first step starts with a morphological analysis with the given building blocks. A morphological analysis is a creativity technique that helps to explore a wide range of possible solutions. During the first iteration, a worksheet with a combination table is provided that is shown in this example. The worksheet contains the visual element and selected layout structure building blocks. After a discussion of these results, the morphological analysis is repeated with the quid dimension. Often, not all combinations result in functional visualization ideas. The goal of this sketching task is to systematically explore the design space in order to generate and test unusual combinations. After a second round of discussion, the final selected solutions will be transferred to patterns. For this step, pattern templates and building block stickers are provided, as shown in these examples, and the students assign suitable tasks, data structures, and a sketch to, to each template. The second step focuses on selecting the best options out of the created patterns and to merge them to more complex solutions. For this step, the educator provides a ranked list of relevant visual encodings to the students that is shown in the left column of this table. Then the students are asked to find the visual encodings used in the design of each pattern, which is shown here with six pattern examples. After the ranking step, a fusion step is pursued. The ranked patterns are collected and sorted on a whiteboard, as shown here in the left picture. And then the students try to combine different patterns to cover more complex data and task types. The fusion step is supported by plank sheets for sketching, pattern templates and stickers, as you can see in the right picture. For the last step, the improvement phase, we follow the Gestalt principles of perception as one of the fundamental works to explain cognitive processes to the students. In this step, the students are asked to improve the solutions in order to steer the user's attention towards the important parts of the visualization. These examples show how different Gestalt principles are applied to parallel hierarchies in order to improve the visualization concept. Our methodology has been tested in three different teaching scenarios an information visualization course during winter semester 2019. The pictures show examples of the worksheets, pattern templates and building block stickers. And um, two visualization courses in summer semester 2020. Due to the worldwide pandemic, the last two courses had to be held in an online environment. We used the online collaboration tool Miro and recreated the workshop materials with the Miro boards. 
While our methodology has been applied only three times to InfoVis courses, we have already made several observations and received valuable feedback. First, we observed that some visual elements cannot be distinguished by all students during the sketching task. For example, icons, glyphs, and points lead to similar sketches on this high level of abstraction, what can be seen in this example. Second, we asked students to explain their ideas with a construction plan to each other. We observed how quicker the students understood each other's solutions because of this common language. Third, we made the observation that the sketching tasks were well followed by the students in the online classes. They successfully used both uploading sketches on papers and drawing sketches directly on the Miro board. Different iterations of these workshops are still planned for the future in order to improve and revise the methodology for different scenarios. The supplemental materials with worksheets, examples and the Miro boards are available under this link. And with this, I like to conclude my presentation and look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you, Mandy, for the presentation. We have a couple of questions uh, for you. So how do students sketch their solutions? Um, Enrico Pertini has shared that he always finds some resistance in sketching by hand from his students. They would rather use a digital tool or even code directly. So did you experience something similar? Yeah, at the beginning, it was uh, the first semester, it was easier because we had these worksheets for sketching and then uh, online we, provided both and I was also a bit surprised. I told them, okay, okay, take what you have at home, a piece of paper, just sketch, it doesn't have to be pretty and make a picture of, of with the phone and upload it on the Miro board. But yeah, so many uh, students um, either were drawing directly in the Miro board or they had uh, other sketching tools. So we had really everything from pictures of or copies of sketching notes or even the digital one. So I was also surprised at the end that works so nice <laughs> in the online environment. Yeah, a lot of respect for your efforts. One more really quick question. Are these sheets available for download? Uh, it seems very interesting to do experiments with students. Yes, um, we have the um, download material and the supplemental material. And there's also on the last page a link to the Miro board. So you can even copy the Miro board and try to do the same <laughs> in the digital environment. Awesome, thank you, Mandy. And so next we have Tianyi Li from Loyola University in Chicago to talk to us about how we can refine the distributed sense-making process via crowd auditing. Hi, my name is Tianyi Li. In this video, I'm excited to share with you our work CrowdTrace Visualizing Provenance in Distributed Sensemaking. This work is done in collaboration with Yasmin Belgeth, Dr. Chris North, and Dr. Kurt Luther. This presentation will include introduction and motivation, followed by a system demo, evaluation and results, and finally some reflections and future work. Sensemaking is usually an expert-driven process. Individual analysts need to sift through raw data, extract meaning, and connect the dots. In today's world, the amount of data is increasing dramatically, but the sense-making process is still not scalable enough to support the analysis. Crowdsourcing offers promising opportunities to aggregate intelligence from large numbers of people but it also poses challenges in making sense of the analysis provenance and improving the analysis quality. In this paper, we present a novel concept, crowd auditing, as a way to help individual analysts to visualize and trace the analysis provenance and to debug distributed sense making. We focus on the example of mystery solving which encompasses the holistic sense-making process described in the sense-making loop. 
and the goal is to diagnose the problems in the existing analysis by the crowds and provide feedback to make progress to the mystery solving outcome. We implemented the concept of crowd auditing in a system called CrowdTrace. Next, we want to demo the system by showing how an analyst can make sense of the crowd's mystery solving results, diagnose problems, and provide feedback. My name is Jamie. I'm using CrowdTrace to audit some crowd analysis of a mystery. On the top of the screen, I can see the background and objective of the analysis. The mystery is about a fictional terrorist attack, and the goal is to find the target location. And we already know some clues, like the weapon, time, and terrorist names. The crowd analysis are presented in different columns. The first column lists the 15 raw documents. The crowd selected 12 documents as relevant to the plot. From there, 14 information pieces were extracted from the relevant documents. The information pieces are then organized around candidate locations and their supporting evidence. The fourth and the last column shows the crowd hypothesis and presentation of their analysis results. Reading the crowd presentation, I found that some known clues highlighted in the background are not mentioned. Did the crowds miss the relevant information? By clicking on the first clue, C4, I can search for all occurrences of this keyword. OK, document 13 had some information about C4 and one of the terrorists. What information was extracted from document 13? Why C4 was not included? I see there are three downstream information pieces from document 13. Let me lock this flow and look at those info pieces. The info pieces were extracted by crowd workers who had access to document 13, 23, and 30. It looks like the crowds overlooked this part of document 13 about C4. This seems to be a problem. Let me highlight this part and leave an annotation about it. We need to include the information about C4 in the analysis. I can see all my annotations are listed on the upper right. Let me create a micro task for crowd workers about the C4 problem. I can see a simulated preview of the microtask interface. There are already instructions about the background in the microtask. I can see that my annotation comments are already imported in the problem description. To fix this problem, the crowds need to read the document 13 and extract all relevant information about C4. I see the text I highlighted in the crowd analysis is already imported in the input information. But I want the crowds to read the entire documents. I can import it here. Finally, the format of information should be short sentences, each describing a fact about C4. We evaluated CrowdTrace with the task of refining a mystery-solving analysis. The original mystery contained 15 text documents, in which 10 are relevant and the other 5 are irrelevant noise. We refer to this mystery as the source data. The crowd analysis are generated by 49 crowd workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk. We refer to this analysis as the crowd data. We hired 19 lab participants as auditors to diagnose the crowd data and evaluated their performance from two perspectives. First, we measure their performance by comparing the problems they identified to a list of gold standard problems with the crowd data, developed by two of the authors based on the solution file of the source data. 
Then we measured their quality of feedback by hiring additional crowd workers to work on the microtasks created by the lab participants. The participants created an average of 14 annotations, and most of the annotations were devoted to describe the important problems with the crowd data. Meanwhile, all the important problems were identified by at least one participant. For example, all 19 participants identified the problem of an alias of a terrorist being missing. And only one participant discovered that a piece of extracted information about a particular terrorist was missing in the final presentation. However, the success of problem identification did not show a clear relation to the difficulty of the problems. For example, problems 1, 2, and 3 all occurred in the first step of the crowd analysis and had roughly the same difficulty, since all three problems involved irrelevant documents being included in the crowd analysis. However, problem 1 was identified by 13 participants, problem 2 were identified by 12, but problem 3 was identified by only 5 participants. Overall, CrowdTrace provided a working mechanism to diagnose and refine distributed sense-making generated by a big group of novice crowds. The concept of crowd auditing builds on the traditional auditing processes in business and finance. Future work is needed to apply crowd auditing to different sense-making scenarios to help improve analysis and enable meta-level sense-making. Thank you, Tianyu, for your presentation. We have a couple of questions for you in the chat. So from Alex in Georgia Tech, did you observe biases in the analysis process, such as confirmation bias or maybe the anchoring bias, as mentioned by Michael Correll, or did the disjoint crowd aspect mediate this bias in some way? I'm not sure if this is referring to the auditing process or the original process where we ask crowd workers to generate the analysis. But in general, people, uh, when, uh, when we uh, generate the analysis with crowds, the crowds has uh, limited access to the previous uh, results. But when they have the previous results, they would usually trust whatever was uh, produced by the previous people. And also in the crowd auditing process, it took some effort both in our uh, like study instruction and the tool design to indicate to the uh, like lab users that the crowd might make, make mistakes and they should uh, like look at analysis with a critical mind. Uh, so, but on the other hand, with this um, distributed view and this um, like crowd auditing tool, we see that the confirmation bias is, is less than when we observe when we uh, ask individuals to, to conduct the entire uh, analysis. Very cool. And really quickly, this is from Daria Akbaba. What was the motivation for using this scenario in your study? Um, so I think I clarified the motivation of using mystery solving in the uh, presentation, and that is essentially uh, because we in this include uh, information foraging and synthesizing uh, and is a good representation of uh, sense making process in general. Uh, like the motivation for using crowdsourcing is we see this great potential of this distributed uh, crowd intelligence in solving complex problems, but usually the mixed quality results requires a lot of effort on uh, either researchers or uh, experts to curate and uh, clean up their their uh, analysis outcome. And we want to be able to iteratively refine those um, like a premature analysis so that the crowd can be uh, like used to solve uh, more complex problems with, with less burden on the experts. Awesome, thank you, Tianyi. And next we have Melanie Bonsion from Washington University in St. Louis to talk to us about how visualizations can elicit different decisions. Let's welcome Melanie. Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Bonsillon and today I'll be talking about how visualizations can elicit different decisions in a risk-prone lottery game. First, a little background. 
Researchers in various fields have used different methods to evaluate how visualization impacts risk perception and decision making. In the medical field, people have used hypothetical scenarios to measure how visualization impacts risk behavior. For example, in the study by Galezik et al., participants were asked to rate the seriousness of the disease as well as the helpfulness of screening on a Likert scale. In the visualization field, researchers have measured different decisions made from visualizations using simulations. For example, how to best grow and sell crops given weather information, or when to leave your house to catch the bus on time while minimizing waiting time. Although prior work has examined how visualization impacts decision making, a lot still remains unknown. This is likely because the decisions used in prior studies are all different and there is no concrete method for quantifying and comparing the impact of different encodings. However, other research communities, such as economics and psychology, have been measuring decision-making for decades. In this paper, we leverage work from economic theory to design an online lottery game to evaluate the impact of visualization on risk behavior and gambling decisions. Consider the following question and think of which option you would prefer. Option A, 50% chance to win $1,000 or a 50% chance to win nothing. Option B, $450 for sure. Now, most people would choose a sure amount, but the rational choice is option A. Let's find out why. One of the dominant theories of decision-making, expected utility theory, has served for many years as an economic behavior model and a model of rational choice. It states that people make choices based on their utility, the psychological values of the outcomes. Option A has a higher expected value and is therefore the best option to maximize potential gains according to EUT. But we know that most people don't choose a rational choice. Prospect theory was introduced as an alternative to explain and model people's biased behavior. It states that people tend to underweight common or high frequency events while overweighting rare or low frequency events. We use economic theory to evaluate the impact of five different visualizations on risk behavior and decision making. Pie and circle charts are common in information graphics and market surveys. The triangle, circle, and bar charts are all used in the medical community. We use a lottery decision sheet where participants chose seven probability values and rewards range from 10 to 150 points. Here's an example of a lottery sheet. People were asked to decide between receiving short gains and entering the lottery. Here, the participant has a 25% chance to win 20 points and a 75% chance to win nothing. They chose to settle for a minimum of 15 points as a short gain, then decided to enter the lottery. We run a function that picks a random row on the lottery sheet. If the participant selected short gains for that row, the corresponding value is added to their bonus, where one point represents $0.001. If the participant chose to enter the lottery for that row, we run a lottery simulation based on the probabilities to determine if the participant wins the full amount or wins nothing. Each participant completed 25 lottery sheets and could win a total bonus of up to about $10. We measure the attitude to risk, ranging from risk averse to risk seeking using a measure called Relative Risk Premia, or RRP. An RRP of zero represents risk neutrality. Negative RRP values indicate risk seeking behavior and positive values indicate risk aversion. The certainty equivalent is the value at which the participant chooses to enter the lottery. The expected value, like we saw earlier, is the value at which the gains are maximized. We will now look at the results. Let's look at the first box plot of this series. Here we have the RRP results for the icon group. On the x-axis, we have our probability values, and on the y-axis, the RRP values. 
Recall that lower values for RRP means risk seeking and higher values for RRP means risk averse. We can see that for the icon array, people were risk seeking for smaller probabilities and risk averse for large probabilities. This is exactly what we expect to see as it is in line with prospect theory. Looking at the other conditions, we observe a similar pattern. Now, when comparing RRPs across conditions, we can see that icon arrays have a median RRP of zero, representing risk neutrality. The circle and triangle conditions appear to incite the most risk-seeking behavior. We ran separate Wilcoxon man whitney tests across all pairs of visualizations for all probability values to check our preliminary findings. The results partially confirm that icon arrays led to more risk-averse behavior compared to the text condition. We found that risk behavior for participants in the circle and triangle groups deviated significantly from the non-group overall, providing evidence that participants who saw the triangle design were the most likely to gamble, followed by the circle design. Notice that the bar condition shows no significant difference to the text condition across all probability values. Let's summarize our findings. We found that visualization impacts decision making. Economic theory is a sound method for quantifying and evaluating decision making with visualization. Circle and triangle designs elicit risk seeking behavior. People are most risk neutral with icon arrays. Finally, across all probability values, there was no significant difference between the bar and the text condition. So which visualization is best, icon or bar? On the one hand, according to economic theory, the best decision is the one that maximizes expected utility, the risk neutral decision. On the other hand, we have seen that in real life, people don't make decisions rationally. Our control condition, text, represents expected behavior. It is important to have a better understanding of how people make different types of decisions. Opening the discussion to what constitutes sound decision making will allow us to better understand how visualization impacts decisions. Thank you, Melanie, for the presentation. We have a couple of really great questions in the chat to start off. This is from Madison as well as Thomas. Um, did you look at the comparison between this gains versus loss framework? And if not, could you comment on what you think would happen in the loss frame? That's a great question. Um, so I did not look at the loss domain for this experiment, um, but that's definitely um, an interesting future um, study to conduct. Uh, we found that, I mean, it's known that um, people hate losing more than they like winning. So we see a, a different pattern in the loss domain and I definitely think it would be an inter interesting study. Um, I would think that we would see a similar um, distortion with the visualizations. I mean, I say distortions, but um, um, diversion from risk neutrality in the loss domain proportional to um, the patterns that we see in economic theory. Um, yes, but that would definitely be an interesting study to conduct. Awesome. To quickly follow up, um, Karen Schloss was asking, were there perceptual estimates of area the, the, the same across the different visualizations that you used? Yes, it was the same across the, the different visualizations. And do you have any hypothesis why you observed um, the difference you did? Um, I think um, the differences, and we've shown that they lie in the perceptual process. So really do the graphical perception. Awesome. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So uh, Melanie will be around in the Discord channel to answer other questions. Uh, next, we have Thomas Elves from the University of Lisbon to talk to us about how personality affects preferences in visualization use. Let's welcome Thomas. Hello, my name is Thomas Elves from Inesca Idea Institute Super Technico, and our work is titled Exploring How Personality Models Information Visualization Preferences. Usually products are developed for a general audience, which assumes that everyone interacts the same way with technology. This may lead to an interface that does not satisfy their needs, it is too difficult to understand, or just that it has a bad look and feel, for example. The truth is that we are not the same user, and there are individual characteristics that make each user have different requirements. 
Considering these individual characteristics helps users to predict what will happen, interactions are easy to remember and it reduces their cognitive load. There are some invariant characteristics that distinguish one person from another, which are believed to be stable throughout adulthood. While cognitive abilities refer to mental capabilities in problem solving and reasoning, personality traits are the individual differences in thinking and behaving characteristics. We focus our study on the personality construct which is defined as a set of habitual behaviors, cognitions, and emotional patterns that influence the construction of a mental model. It has shown to have an impact on technology acceptance and technology use. Among the different models that characterize personality, there are two that are well researched. The first one is the five-factor model. It divides personality in five main traits and each of these traits in six subdimensions called facets. Regarding information visualization, neuroticism, and extroversion, have been shown to affect the time users take to complete the task and on its accuracy. The same traits, in addition to openness to experience, also show effects regarding performance in hierarchical contexts. Finally, neuroticism and openness to experience change how users rate the information visualization systems regarding their attractiveness and dependability. As one can see from these studies, the first three traits of the five-factor model have been extensively studied. The other personality construct is locus of control, which is divided between internal and external locus. In particular, the latter is categorized between powerful others and chance. Locus of control has shown effect in search performance across hierarchical, time series and item comparison visualization designs. Additionally, it helps to explain visualization use and behavioral patterns. Yet, if we take a closer look at their findings, there are unexplored traits such as agreeableness and conscientiousness. In addition, to the best of our knowledge, there are no studies that use both external locus of control subdimensions. Moreover, while personality traits are usually studied, there is no research on facets, which are a component of personality traits. In order to bridge this gap, we start our research based on how personality affects preferences. And our first decision is regarding which context we are addressing. In addition, which idioms are relevant in this context? The first context is a hierarchy one. Our scenario is the distribution of food consumed by a household within a month. Regarding the idioms, we are using a Sankey diagram, a tree map, a bubble chart, and a sunburst. The next context is evolution over time. Our scenario is the number of registrants and participants in a marathon held annually in the United States. We are considering an area chart, a line chart without points, and a line chart with points. Finally, the last context is the comparison one. Here we show the levels of happiness index among six different countries. We consider a word cloud, a pie chart, an horizontal bar chart, a radar chart, and a vertical bar chart. We run a user test with 64 participants, where we collected for each one of them 38 personality variables and their preference regarding the 12 idioms. User preference was assessed with a 7-point Likert scale. We decided to study the relationship between personality and user preference with two approaches. The first one is through correlation. Through Spearman's correlation method, we found interesting results, although our Bonferroni leads us to reject them. Indeed, our results suggest that personality effects may be on both trait and facet levels. The remaining results also suggest a correlation with personality variables, including the trait of agreeableness and the external subdimensions of the locus of control. The other approach is through clustering algorithms. Our first step is to find how many clusters our dataset should have in the end. In order to do it, we run hierarchical density-based clustering that gave us three clusters at an output. We then use the k-means clustering algorithm to group our participants. Afterwards, we check whether the personality clusters were different from the others. We found that all personality variables, with the exception of openness to experience and agreeableness, were significantly different between clusters. Cluster 1 has people with high levels of conscientiousness and internal locus of control. In addition, people have the lowest values of neuroticism and the external dimensions. In contrast, Cluster 2 has people with the lowest values for conscientiousness and the highest values of extroversion and agreeableness. Finally, Cluster 3 has the participants with the highest levels on neuroticism and on both the external dimensions. Afterwards, we run an a priori algorithm in each cluster to find the most frequent preferred idioms for the participants. We then analyze the rules and chose the most frequent ones. These are our final results. In the hierarchy context, both clusters 1 and 2 prefer a sunburst, while the tree map is the one for cluster 3. In contrast, the evolution over time context 
shows a preference in cluster 1 for line charts with points, while the remaining clusters prefer without points. Finally, all clusters prefer horizontal bar charts for the comparison context. This result may point towards that context being the depends of personality, while the remaining two clearly have differences between each cluster. In light of this, our results suggest that personality is a differentiating factor when it comes to designing information visualization systems. We found that all traits suggest interaction effect and some facets suggest main effects. Regarding all limitations, our study suffers from the multiple comparisons problem with so many variables. In future studies, we aim at targeting a single variable at a time. In addition, we need a larger sample size to take conclusions. We also want to explore more idioms and more datasets with different levels of complexity. In addition, more scenarios for the context. Another interesting approach is to add more tests in order to check whether they have an effect on user preferences and check the impact of familiarity bias. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for your presentation. We have a qu couple of questions from the chat. Um, Marty Hurst asked, um, their existing research has found that some people don't like data charts at all and they prefer text or language. Um, is this something that um, you considered? Do you think there could be an influence of personality on, on um, maybe other than, or, or maybe other than uh, personality on uh, maybe familiarity with text or, or charts? on people's preferences. Yeah, yeah I got it. Uh, first of all, thank you for the question. I think that's interesting as well, but in this study, we only considered using idioms. So we have a no, we don't have a no idiom approach, but that's a cool future work that we should consider. And where do you think this work is going? Is the end game of this research having visualizations or interfaces that changes according to each user's personality? Yeah, that's the main objective by waiting how Several people are developing methods to extract personality traits and facets from like social media or biofeedback. We would like to in the future, in the future, take into account these ubiquitous computing to then improve how visualizations provide their idioms and etc. for each user. Awesome. And really quickly, uh, could you comment on how you think cultural uh, influences could play a role in personality and their ch chart type preferences? Oh, I believe that. I mean, just taking into account between East and West, like if people read from right to left and other people read from left to right, you can already see that there are some differences. So we would like to see whether culture imposes personality or whether you can take them independently. But that's, as I said, it's a future study because a problem with working with personality is that since you have so many variables and interactions between different psychological constructs, you can and you need to have a really large sample to work with and extract data. And right now, since this is an exp exploratory study and we are in the COVID phase, we can't really gather a large sample. Thank yeah, you totally as well. Understood. Thank you, Thomas. There's a couple more questions lingering around in the Discord channel. Just make sure to check them out. Uh, yeah, next, there. awesome. And next we have Enrico Bertini from New York University to share with us whether the most effective visualizations are the ones that we can extract information from as precisely as possible. Let's welcome Enrico. Hi, my name is Enrico Bertini. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about our short paper, why shouldn't all charts be scatter plots beyond precision driven visualizations? This is work in collaboration with my colleagues, Michael Correll and Stephen Franconeri, and is the result of several months of discussions and reflections about the role that precision plays in data visualization research, pedagogy, and practice. So I wanna start with a specific example. This is one of the most iconic data visualizations ever created, is the famous Minard's Armée visualization that depicts the Napoleon's Russian campaign that uh, was disastrous. Uh, what you see here is um, a series of lines. These lines represent the, um, the army moving over time and space, and the width of the line represents the size of the army. And unfortunately, as you can see, it gets thinner and thinner as they moved from uh, uh, east to west and from west to east. 
and uh, which represents a lot of human casualties. And this has been called the best statistical drawing ever created, and for a good reason. So one problem that we notice with this is that if we had to follow the precepts of data visualization research, and in particular using the ranking of visual variables, then um, we would have a problem because the, the map uses line width as the main visual channel to represent the one of the most important uh, pieces of information, which is the size of the army. And what we know from the ranking of visual variables is that position on a common scale is the most effective and most precise channel, followed by position on an aligned scale, then length, angle, and so on. So as a thought experiment, what we did was to create an equivalent representation, equivalent what I mean by equivalent is using the same information. And here we have two scatter plots that uh, represent the same data. One for going from left to right and from right to left. So on the, way, on the X axis, you have longitude and on the Y axis, now you have the uh, size of the army. And now this is much more precise. You can compare much, much more precisely the size of the army over space and also over time. But I think that if I put these two visualization one next to the other, I think you wouldn't be convinced that the one on the right is better than the one on the left, despite being way more precise. So why is that? So on the one hand, precision is the cornerstone of visualization research and pedagogy. But on the other end, the reality of this is that the, the visualizations that we see out there, the best visualizations that we see out there tends to be much richer and way more sophisticated than those that we would create following exactly these precepts. So here are uh, some examples of recent visualizations created by some of the best data visualization designers out there, and they don't necessarily follow these precepts. So the contribution of this paper is to provide reflections on what we call three insufficiencies of precision-driven visualization. So let me say that I don't have time here to represent these three insufficiencies in uh, detail, so I strongly encourage you to read the paper if you're interested. So here in the talk, I'm only uh, scratching the surface of what we, of the content that we have in the, of the topic that we are presenting here. So the first insufficiency is that precision is neither necessary nor sufficient for effectiveness. And in order to explain that, we created an example. In these uh, six plots, we represent exactly the same data, a number of time series, and we used different representations. And on top of these representations, we have two main observations. The first one is that position can be used in many different ways. So all of these plots that you see on the left, they all use position to represent a quantity. However, I think you would agree that they are very different. They afford different visual tasks. And you could even argue that some are better than others for certain purposes. So in a way, what we can say here is that position is underspecified. So if we say that position is the best channel, we're not really saying much because position can be used in many different ways. Second observation, less accurate channels can actually afford very useful tasks. So for instance, if you look at the plot at the bottom right, this is a heat map. And here we use the intensity of the color to represent the value. And color intensity is supposed to be the worst visual channel one can use to represent quantitative information. But I guess you would agree that you see a lot of interesting patterns and it's definitely not bad as an overview of this data. And I guess it would, it would become even better, better and more effective if we were tasked with the problem of visualizing a larger number of time series because it would scale better than the ones that you see on the left. So second insufficiency, precision is not sufficient for comprehension and interpretation. 
And I guess you would agree that comprehension and interpretation are very important factors for data visualization. So here I want to present the results coming from a very interesting study presented in 1999 by Jeff Zaks and Barbara Tversky. So they ran, they ran a number of interesting studies showing um, that people interpret data very differently when it is presented with different plots. So in this case, the same information presented as a very simple bar chart or with a very simple line chart. Both these charts afford very high precision, but the kind of interpretation that people um, extract from these plots are very different. And some of them are even absurd, like this one. The more male a person is, the taller he or she is, which of course doesn't make any sense. Last insufficiency, precision is not sufficient for rhetoric, emotions, persuasion, and memory. And I guess, again, you would agree that all of these factors are very important for data visualization. So here again, I have space only for one example. This comes from the great designer, Georgia Lupi. And this is a project that she created in collaboration with a friend. Unfortunately, for um, somewhat sad case. So this is data collected by Georgia's friend about a disease that her daughter has. And in order to understand this disease better and to depict it visually, they started collecting data about um, the daily effects of this disease and then try to create a visualization that tells the story of this disease and also the emotions that are related to this disease that, as you can imagine, are where and are very strong. And this is what Georgia came up with, a very emotional and interesting and engaging visualization, which I guess you would agree doesn't have necessarily a lot of precision. So once again, precision doesn't seem to be particularly important in this case either. So what is to be done? What can we do? Well, I want to say something important. We definitely were not arguing for throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The ranking of visual variables has been instrumental to a lot of advancements in visualization, especially in the development of amazing data visualization software, but also in the ped pedagogy of data visualization. However, as we have demonstrated in the talk and more precisely in the paper, uh, there are lots of limitations in uh, an excessive focus on precision. So what we would really like to see happening is more research in this area and trying to answer some of these questions. How can we rectify and expand the theory? Because the theory seems to be insufficient. And when does it work? And when does it not work? We would like to generate a better understanding of why these limitations exist. And if this limitation exists, what else can be done? How can we fix it? So there is a lot of work to do, and we really hope that by watching this uh, video and reading our paper, you will be inspired to do more work in this area. With this, I'm concluding my talk. I want to thank you very much for listening to me, and I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Enrico, for the great presentation. You inspire a lot of great discussions in the Discord channel. And um, I'm summarizing some questions and comments here. But could you comment on the role of precision for exploratory versus explanatory purposes, such as you know, used in visual analytics versus visual communication? Yeah, I think that um, I'm not sure there is really a big distinction between the two from the, the, the few. So one of, one of the exercises that, that, we have, that we have tried to do internally is to build, is to create a lot of examples of visualizations where precision doesn't seem to play a major role. And I think there are situations even in exploratory settings where you may or may not notice something and a visualization that doesn't use the most precise representation may actually make some patterns more visible or more or easier to detect. So 
I think unfortunately there is a lot more research to do here, so I, I don't have a I don't have a definite answer. But my intuition is that you may have very similar problems in exploration. Yeah, and thank you for for that. And um, relating back to our previous the previous talks in the session on data insights, how do you think visualizations that prioritize precision can influence the insights people extract from data? Again, I think that we have a little bit of an obsession for extracting precise information, which doesn't seem to reflect what what people actually do with visualization. I think that's the premise of the of the work. There are, there are way more complex um, processes happening. And I think one of, the, one of the most interesting things that happens with visualization is to notice something and then trying to read it, right? As well as I think somebody in the chat was, was commenting on comprehension. If you don't even know what is going on in a visualization, then you can't do anything, right? So uh, there is a role for precision, but I think, I think the main claim here is that um, there's too much of a focus on precision. Yeah, really wonderful food for thought. Thank you. Uh, there's more comments and, and questions in, in the chat. So I encourage you to check out Discord. I know you're already on there. Um, so moving forward, we know there is a considerable amount of empirical work in the community that focus on the efficiency of visual channels in extracting information. And as researchers, we've been creating design guidelines based on these research. And what's interesting is that next Paul will speak to us about a potential conflict between these research-based guidelines and visualization practice in the real world on how designers think about and use chart junks. Uh, let's welcome Paul. Studies have been conducted over the past decade to investigate the effects of visual embellishments on users. Researchers have examined a range of phenomena from traditional performance metrics, such as speed and accuracy, to other metrics such as memorability and engagement. One takeaway from these studies is that a balance between extreme minimalism and embellishment should be sought in a contextually appropriate manner. While this may seem like a straightforward design guideline, there's not been much focus on how designers think about how to use chart junk in their everyday practice. We argue that focusing on the user perspective only provides at best a limited view of how a concept like chart junk might actually be used in real world design settings. In this work, we take a practice led approach to understanding designers perspectives on chart junk and its use in their everyday practice. To do this, we conducted semi structured interviews with 20 data visualization practitioners. This was done as part of a broader effort to understand data visualization design practice. The portion of the transcript where we talked specifically about chart junk makes up about 10 minutes of the roughly hour long interviews. Recruiting was done via social media, the, the data visualization society Slack workspace, the InfoViz email list, and we also directly contacted more than 200 individual practitioners and more than 30 visualization design agencies. Interviews were conducted remotely via video conferencing and were recorded and transcribed. Our interviews focused on four main topics. First, whether participants were familiar with the concept of chart junk or visual embellishment. Second, if and how they relied on it in their design work. Third, whether they had any specific opinions about its use. And fourth, whether they were familiar with the history of the idea and its subsequent discourse in the academic or practitioner spaces. Transcripts were inductively coded by the two researchers following a standard process for thematic analysis. We engaged in multiple rounds of independent coding with regular meetings to establish an agreement on the codes. We subsequently engaged in several rounds of theme development from the codes that we had generated. And our themes are presented here in relation to two main questions about how practitioners understand chart junk and the factors that influence its use in practice. We had a number of 
participants talk about some notion of a corrective movement that had taken place away from extreme minimalism towards some kind of acceptance of embellishment. P18 exemplifies this by saying Tufty was really strong in opposing chart junk. And I think now there's a movement going a little bit in the other direction, saying that, well, adding icons to charts can make things clearer, for example. So, yeah, it's a bit like a pendulum, I think. And with Tufty, it went in one direction, and now it's going a little bit back in the other direction. We also noted a number of conceptual and terminological issues, one being that there's little consensus on the definition of chart junk. Uh, P6 says, I do think the definition is, is different. I'm not 100% sure that everyone knows or thinks the same thing when they think of chart junk. We had some people talking about chart junk in reference to animation and interactivity in visualizations. P13, for instance, says, if you move your mouse along the screen and it, I don't know, changes colors, or when you click, it radiates, radiates out, maybe it's helpful in relation to discussing chart junk. We also had many participants note the subjective nature of defining chart junk. Uh, P11 says it depends on what you call chart junk. When I look at the New York Times data visualization, I don't think there's really any junk there. They do have things that are sometimes whimsical, or the pudding does this too. It's always motivated. When we look at the factors that influence the use of chart junk, we see that balance and context are indeed important. Uh, many participants talked about this need for balance, with P5 saying, I try to strike a balance between making something look nice and kind of fun and cute versus just polluting it with a whole bunch of nonsense. Multiple participants talked about f factors that went beyond just context, one of them being a lack of skill in creating embellishments. P18 says, maybe I should also mention that I don't know how to draw. I'm just really bad at making things around or outside the pure data visualization things. So I simply cannot produce chart junk, so to speak. I don't know how to draw. So for me, it always focuses on the data. Multiple participants also discussed issues of their personal style, which influenced how they think about and use chart junk. P10 says, I lean slightly towards chart junk because I will always, especially in interactive projects, I believe in eye candy 100%. Like, I'm going to animate that chart and bring it to life. Number of participants also discussed external constraints that influenced their use of, of embellishments. P14 says, in order to maintain some sort of fidelity to a brand, there are times when throwing a bunch of teddy bears on the screen makes sense. We also noted somewhat of a, a cognitivist versus experiential focus that was surfaced through our conversations with practitioners. Uh, in a number of instances, uh, revealing some sort of underlying design philosophy and value about what's important. P19 says, for instance, what does embellishment help tell you? I'm not making these charts for someone to be like, oh, that's pretty cute. No, here's the locations and here's the serious data. I'm not trying to be cutesy. We also had participants stating uh, exemplifying a more experiential focus, stating somewhat of, of the opposite. Um, and uh, quotes can be found in the paper. So some takeaways from this work, we see that the use of chart junk um, as a design concept is very much personal and situated. Um, it goes beyond notions of performance or memorability and engagement that, that are very commonly discussed in academic circles. We see other factors such as personal style, external constraints, uh, personal design philosophy, influencing how practitioners perceive and use chart junk in their everyday practice. What this says is that as a field, if we really want to influence visualization design practice, we need more practice-led research that considers the unique ways in which designers generate and use knowledge in real world settings. These are ways that might be quite different from how researchers and scientists do this. We also surface uh, potential opportunities to examine how visualization tools might support the creation of embellishments, uh, which is further discussed in the paper. 
Thanks for listening. Thank you for your presentation, Paul. Um, there is a lot of great discussion on the Discord channel. So let's talk about the term chart junk. Uh, what do you think about this term? And do you think it automatically imposes a negative bias towards chart embellishments when you use the word chart junk? Yeah, I mean, it's explicitly negative. <laughs> so, so that, you know, that's definitely an issue. Um, uh, it's extremely popular and um, referenced a lot. We deliberately uh, used various synonyms in our interviews to try to um, get at this issue of how people perceive chart junk and whether or not the label itself influences how it's used in practice. So uh, yes, it's explicitly negative and, and I see a lot of conversation going on in Discord about how we need to get rid of it, um, which uh, may or may not be possible, I don't know. And this is one of my, my own questions. Did you find any trends or difference between people's attitude towards these chart embellishments depending on the profession that they're in or the purpose of their visualization? Yes, definitely. Um, so people who were doing more business dashboards kind of stuff um, didn't seem as, as keen on, on using embellishments. Um, people that were consider, would consider themselves more sort of creative uh, designers uh, tended to use those more. I don't think that's uh, terribly surprising. Um, I think the interesting finding, though, is that there are these more personal factors um, that that can stem from an underlying design philosophy uh, that that we sort of that we elicited in these interviews. Um, so, yes, is the short answer. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. I know we're a little bit over um, time, so we'll have to wrap up the session. But um, thank you, everyone, for attending this session. And I encourage everyone to continue your discussions on Discord. And I wish you all enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And I'll see you around on the Discord channels. We present a high quality tube rendering method for 3D line datasets. GPU based ray casting is used to render line segments as rounded cones to allow for smooth connections along individual lines and variation in radius. We support transparency by a novel approach combining visibility order rendering with an order independent transparency method. To improve depth and feature perception, ambient occlusion is employed. We present an interface to visually analyze and steer zero-shot learning models. Our interface is designed to diagnose attribute mispredictions to convey potential failure modes in zero-shot learning. Using our interface, the user can select multiple categories for analysis. We allow the user to steer the model by changing the weights of potentially problematic attributes based on their analysis. Visualizations are about visual patterns, but there's more, much more. We show the connections between more than 100 arguments on why visualization works. And don't forget to check out our website. Blockchain has gained more attention and its applications are emerging. We collect 76 blockchain visualization tools and systematically classify them into five aspects. Target blockchain, blockchain data, target audience, task domain, and visualization type. In the end, we look at open challenge in blockchain visualization.
Traditional clustering tools do not include users in the analysis loop. We present PK clustering, a new approach for interactive clustering using POVs. First, users specify their prior knowledge. Several algorithms are run and match with the prior knowledge. Users then build a consolidated clustering iteratively with suggestions based on consensus, the graph, and their knowledge of the data. The result is a consolidated clustering. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. In this work, we conducted a design study with clinical researchers to develop a visual analytics application for exploring disease progression pathways. As a result, we developed DPVIS, which seamlessly integrates hidden markup models with interactive visualizations. The usage scenario and user experiences demonstrate the usefulness of the application to gain useful insights out of disease progression trajectories in a transparent manner.
Visualizing the performance progression of machine learning techniques is often achieved by plotting the accuracy in a line chart. For specific tasks such as multi-class classification, they hide important factors such as inner class confusion and instance level details. We propose Instance Flow, a tool for interactive visualization of the evolution of classifier confusion on the instance level. It is common for users to struggle to understand how to effectively use TSME. No idea how to select hyperparameters, assess the quality of the results, investigate the existence of shapes and other patterns. TBSME covers all these tasks. We provide diverse projections to choose from, global and local quality assessment, investigations of shapes and patterns, and more. Do you have a research question but aren't sure how to go about answering it? Are you interested in collaborating with psychologists but want to learn more about how they do research? Our paper presents a comprehensive toolkit of empirical methods organized across four categories to help you think about presenting visualizations as experimental stimuli in order to explore and measure how people perceive data. Check out our paper.
Taximis is an interactive real analytics system to help tax officers identify suspicious tax division groups. The system integrates the traditional data mining algorithm and visual analytics techniques. Four coordinate views are provided to support interactive exploration of tax division evidence. We demonstrate its usefulness through case studies using real-world test data and expert interviews. We present our work on data visualization, a technique which helps facilitate understanding of physical measurements and quantities by providing visible experiences to users in virtual reality. This allows them to experience the ground truth of what the data is in reality as compared to the abstract nature of conventional data visualization. We hope our work will spur new considerations into how immersive technologies can be used for visualizing information and that you will find it interesting. Language models are highly performant across many language understanding tasks. Comprehending the linguistic knowledge encoded by these models, however, remains a challenging problem. We introduced an approach for visually analyzing contextualized embeddings produced by language models. Our design shows how much context is captured by embeddings, the ability of embeddings to capture meaningful text spans, and linguistic relationships represented by the embeddings. Being able to perform visual analysis on sensitive data in a privacy-preserving way has become more and more important. In this work, we look at two major research questions in differentially private data visualization towards better understanding of the relationship between the privacy parameter, visualization type, the analytic tasks, and users' performance through cross-source user study and simulated comparisons. Given a dimensionality reduction scatterplot, we project its original subspace. Through the orientation and shape of our glyphs, both the global trends and the local patterns can be identified. To transform the vectors, we use the implicit function theorem. We apply our method to different kinds of data. We present columnar data augmentation through visual analytics. Kava lets users augment their data with additional attributes found on knowledge graphs. To construct a new attribute, each row of a data set is mapped to a node on a knowledge graph. Each augmented datum is the result of a query over the knowledge graph in the neighborhood of that node. We propose a multi-perspective simultaneous embedding MPSC algorithm for visualizing high-dimensional data based on multiple pairwise distances between the data points. MPSC computes positions for the points in 3D and provides different views into the data by means of 2D projections that preserve each of the given distance matrices. MPSC works on abstract data as well as graphs. Region-based vortex measures are commonly used to extract vortices. The ideal threshold to extract the vortex boundary, however, varies spatially. To detect vortices without manual thresholding, we utilize supervised deep learning. For the regression, we evaluate three recent network architectures. The resulting networks are able to detect vortices that grow in size due to diffusion, despite their angular momentum becoming smaller. Firstly, we extract contours of virions and distribution of spike proteins. From a newly estimated contour, a 3D mesh with evaluated triangles is obtained. In the last step, rules describing relations between protein instances are defined by the user. The resulting model is created by application of all rules on the generated 3D mesh. Many seamless strategies pay little attention to the preservation of significant contextual structure. In its paper, we propose a context-aware graph sampling method in a vectorized space to preserve not only contextual structures but also significant topological features. Welcome to pay attention to our paper. Its ID is 1259.
Nowadays, data is often distributed and owned by different participants. There is an emerging need to provide a joint visualization, such as a ts and &E projection, to serve as the full picture and data analysis. If the participants are privacy sensitive, how can we build a joint projection without data leakage? Conventional embedding algorithms, such as the ts &E, are designed for single-site computation and require data centralization. Privacy leakage may h up and in three stages in the visualization pipeline. What do you believe is the correlation between labor union participation and corporate profits of different companies? How would you update your belief after seeing this scatter plot? In this study, we use a new elicitation technique to understand how people update their beliefs about correlations after seeing different visualizations with and without uncertainty depictions. Many techniques can be used to render and visually explore large 3D line sets with transparency. However, 